back, we've changed the PA. Okay, back, yeah, good. There's something about malty, what does malt do to beer? Uh, and this morning's session is presented by Graham Craig, or Tom Clark. So I guess they have a Yeah, I think so, unless you want to yell, I think probably they can use them. Um, there we go, got my slides. Um, so I'll start out with a little bit about myself. Um, I started out my career as a chef more than anything in the growing world. I did about six, seven years working in restaurants in New York City. Yeah, can't hear it all? All right, there we are. Um, six, seven years working in restaurants and good grounding in, in wine mostly and then a lot of just general flavor things. Uh, then I moved on to a degree in food science. Uh, and that's where I really started home brewing and I've been doing that for about six years. You go to school and learn about you know, crackers and food processing and go home and start applying that in my own little personal brewery. And then I uh, ended up following a girl out to New Zealand where I got started doing uh, malting. I went, went for a tour one day and then got offered a job uh, two weeks later. Uh, so where I work is at Blackwood Malting, which is a uh, map and shove it all, uh, down in the uh, Canberra Plains of New Zealand. We are uh, small maltings, focusing mainly on the craft sector. And we also, also a farm, so it started out as a barley farm with a farmer who wanted to um, add more value to his crops and decided to do that by building a malt plant on site. And we've since grown to, from the initial one kiln we built on site to four. And there's also a custom built malt roaster as well. So we've grown quite a bit, uh, focused on the craft sector. So I'll take you through the malting process today, both the uh, base malt process and then roasted and specialty malts. And then a little bit about how that helps make better beer through knowing your malt. Um, so we'll start off very early on. That's the raw barley coming into the plant. And like I said, we grow about half the barley uh, that we use on site, and the other half is contracted out through our growers. Um, there's two crops, so winter and spring barley, and the reason there, the main reason for that is uh, if there's a big hit of weather that pretty much It'll rain in the crop, it'll start spreading the fields, and it's pretty useless for, <coughs> this just happened in the states with Montana and Idaho and they're all getting hit by a big weather storm, and what happens is the grain starts to grow on stop, and so when we put it to the plant, nothing, nothing happens. And the reason probably two crops throughout the year is just mitigating some of that risk and getting a little more barley, um, yeah, saving ourselves from that. Um, it's stored throughout the year, so we can store the barley for about 18 months in silos, and it's still perfectly suitable to use in the malting plant. Um, there's some little issues in terms of uh, dormancy, and uh, it'll start to lose some of its germination capacity as it ages, but in general, it's not, not an issue. Um, first thing it does when it comes through is it goes through our, our lab down at the bottom, and we're looking at moisture content, germination capacity, and nitrogen content are the main, the main factors. And there's other um, fungus and mold growth so that are more kind of quality and safety issues. There's toxins and things like that growing in the grain. But mainly we look at nitrogen and things like that. And then it comes to the plant, it gets cleaned, goes through our screener, and goes into the steeps. Uh, those are not steeps, but that's uh, barley growing in the field. There's, if you ask a farmer, there's about 30 different kind of growth stages to barley. I could not even begin to talk about them, but he goes, oh, it's growth stage 22, and it's starting to do this, this, and this, and it just kind of goes straight over my head. But this is, I think, like uh, the head of the barley is starting to get a bit of weight to it. It's starting to ripen in the field, and that's the stage it's at right now. So this is ripening, no more water going on it, and we're praying for hot, dry, windy days. So then it comes into the plant and goes into the steeps, which are here on the left. So that's uh, barley in the steep, and then the steep filled with water at the bottom. Uh, only two inputs to the process, and that's water and barley. There's nothing else that goes into it, and from those two inputs we get the 20, 18, something different malts, so it's quite fascinating that through controlling those and how we and how we control the germination process, you can get all these different range of flavors, different range of malts, all from barley. Um, so the main process in the steep is to increase the moisture content. We want to bring it from about 14% moisture up to 46, and what this does is it Tells the barley it's time to grow. It's the same thing that happens if you plant today when it's neat growing the ground. It would soak up moisture from the dirt and get to about 46% moisture, and then it would try to grow. And we're just doing that with millions of grains in a big tank. 
Uh, the whole process takes about 36 hours, and it's periods of, of soaking, and it's periods of air resting, and it's um, <coughs> all just designed to get that barley to start growing, get the moisture content up, and get it to the stage where it's chitted. And this is when the rootlets, rootlets have just started to poke out, and that's a picture there, chitted barley, you can see these little white, you should be able to see some little white chits on the end. That's the, the rootlets coming out of the grain, and that's what we call a chitted barley. So then we move it on to the germination phase, and this is where pretty much everything happens, for the most part. Uh, at least enzyme production and uh, the main kind of brewing aspects and modification, this all happens in the germination boxes. Um, so it's still growing. Left alone, it really just wants to take off the gum grass, and if we did not have any control on those boxes, it would turn into a big brick of, of barley, essentially. So you get a big layer of grass on the top, you could take it out and make an igloo with it. It's that kind of thick and uh, just hard to work with. We don't have the stairs going through and we don't have uh, any control on the process. And so what we are controlling is the underneath the bed, you can't really see it, but that's a perforated floor. If you look at the germination box on the bottom, so there's giant fans blowing air underneath the bed, up through it, and then out into that air as it gets recycled, or it goes out the top of the plant. And control the temperature, so we have uh, big heat exchangers going through there, keeping the temperature down, limiting the amount of oxygen going in, because we don't want it to, we want it to grow, but we don't want it to turn to a plant. We want it to grow and modify and produce those enzymes, uh, alpha and beta amylase, epoxase, dextrinases, a lot of proteases, and start to modify rather than go to the complete process and turn to a plant. <coughs> we measure by looking at the aperspire growth, which is the, the first leaf as it starts coming under the, the husk of the grain. And it's hard to show without some like, figure one scientific Thing, so I probably will I'll skip that and say it takes about five or six days. Uh, looking at the grain, you can see it starts to grow through. If it goes too far, you get a little sprouted grass coming out the top of the grain. Um, so here's about four or five days in. You see the, the rootlets have come through, but they haven't really developed much, and that's due to the, the controlling the airflow, controlling the temperatures, and making it consistent. So then on um, modification, which is what happens. <coughs> in this process. It's uh, the, the physical and chemical changes that happen during malting. It's the sum of all of those changes. Um, the, the main one for brewing is degradation of those the endosperm and making those starch accessible, breaking down the cellulose layer around the outside of the starch so that when you're, when you're mashing, all that starch is available for the enzymes to, to burn. And so partially modified malts are ones traditionally older European styles, which are Often need protein rests and acid rests and things like that to get get the most out of. And uh, fully modified, which is most malts these days, just suitable for a single step. All the work is done in our process in that germination box, and not necessarily on the brewing and the mashing. End. And one way to kind of get a sense of where a malt is in terms of modification is your cobalt index, and that's um, as for the analysis sheets or things like that, and what that is, it's a ratio of the soluble nitrogen and the total nitrogen in the grain. And so, as those prote proteases are working on the protein and breaking it down, it creates smaller and smaller chunks of protein. And then, it, as those chunks get smaller, they become soluble in water. And so, as a measure of modification, we're looking at a measure of how far those proteins are broken down. So, we'll say a cobalt index of around 32 would be an under-modified or low-modified malt and upwards of 40 to 44 is a fully modified, fully modified malt. Uh, then we move on to kilning, which is uh, mainly a drying phase, but also where all the color and flavor comes into the malts. And it can make the difference between a, um, from green malt at the end of germination, it can become either pale malt, closer malt, all the way up to a Munich or Vienna, just based on what we change in the process. So there's three phases of the kilning. The first one is, Drying out the unbound water, so this will bring the moisture content down to maybe 20%. Uh, a lot of airflow, very low temperatures, around 50 and even 45 to 55 degrees C. And it's all fresh air going through, there's nothing recirculated. Just dry air from outside, going through the grain bed and out, pulling a lot of moisture at the same time. 
Uh, temperature doesn't change much in this stage. It's, there's a lot of evaporative cooling going on, so you get very even temperature until the second phase of drying, which is slightly increasing the temperature. But this is also the point when the humidity starts to come down. And as soon as the humidity and grain temperature meet, you get a big spike and the temperature starts climbing. Um, it's down around 6 7% moisture at this point. And, and then the, first, the final phase, which is cured. And this is where most of the color and flavor comes into malt. And this is what makes uh, Pilsner malt, Pilsner, and ale malt, and and so forth. Um, it can go anywhere in temperature from 80 degrees C to 110, and time-wise between two hours and 10 hours, depending on how much flavor and how much color you want in that finished product. Um, so a Pilsner malt would be around 80 degrees C for about four, four to five hours, whereas an ale would be almost 100 degrees C and about 10 hours. And during that whole process is the monster going into the kiln, grabbing a sample, and tasting it to seeing where it is, because they're all going to react. All barley's are going to come through a little bit differently depending on nitrogen content, how much is available for may have reactions, things like that. Um, and from there, it's, it's finished malt. So this top picture here is a uh, unloading the kiln. So it's um, dry malt at that stage, we germinate and kiln the same vessel. So unloading the kiln at the top, and then it gets cleaned through the same cleaning process, goes into storage, gets blended, bagged, and sent out. Uh, and then we go to roast, which is quite interesting because we can pull from any different stage in the process and get wildly different results, um, depending on where, where we pull from. Uh, so the pictures we have on the top, this is our malt roaster in which being built. And I just thought it's quite interesting, you don't usually get to see the inside of it all open up like that. So it's just a big series of blades designed to keep the barley moving around, keep it from sticking to the outside walls, and creating a giant fire essentially. But cool thing to see, and that's the malt roaster in action down at the bottom. Um, I'd say there's probably two types of roaster malts, and one, the big one, is the crystal malts, your sacrified malts. And the difference between these and the roasted is it's actually mashed inside the roaster and in the husk. So we are able to pretty much close all the vents off on that roaster and blow the air through the outside drum and keep the temperature around 80 degrees, which is the malt temperature inside is around, I think, 75 or something like that. But perfect temperature for mashing. Um, again, you're going in, you're taking samples, uh, squeezing them, and you can actually squeeze it out and get this really sweet clear liquid when it's just perfectly uh, modified and you open all the flaps, run a bunch of hot air through it, start the drying phase and then upwards in high temperatures and start getting the caramelization colors and the actions that go on to give you all the crystal malt flavors. And then uh, roasted malts. So this can be kind of a unique one. Because, like, a biscuit malt would be a base malt put in the roaster to <coughs> and comes out at whatever color temperature we're looking for. Um, others can come through the phase as either raw barley going in, you can use chilled malt going in, you can use dry malt going in. Um, all have unique, um, we'll do different things to the finished finish malt. So if I start with a, a base malt, um, it's already been dried. There's a lot, a lot less moisture in the house, so there's a lot more issues with uh, burning and stringent type flavors. But uh, say like black patent malt, where that's expected and that's what you want. Or you can start with a chili malt where there's a little more moisture, a little more um, buffering against that husk burning. So you can get a bit more, you get higher in temperature without the bitter and kind of stringent flavors coming through. And so there's a lot of things you can do in the roaster to actually change that. Um, and with the roasted malt's color, it's a good indicator of what kind of flavors you're going to get out of it. Um, looking at different chocolate malts from different suppliers. They're all sorts of different colors, but to taste them, it's not apples to apples. It's depending on who's roasting malt, who's deciding that it's ready, it's not going to be pulled out of the roaster. And um, from my own experience just testing these in the lab, uh, you get different different flavors coming through with a 900 EBC malt to a 1200 EBC to a 500 EBC. And it's pretty pronounced kind of what, what changes these high temperatures make to the malt. Uh, and then we have uh, melanoid malt, which is kind of should have its own slide. It's a bit of a separate category. Um, it's a 
stew, so to speak. So we try to keep all the oxygen out of the grain, let it almost ferment in itself. It'll get a lot of, it'll generate a lot of heat coming through, and the whole grain bed will sit there and go to about 45, 50 degrees C. And just put bacterial growth and uh, protein breakdown, and at least a lot of melanoid production malts. That's why it's usually called like melanoid malts, so there's still like aurora malts, or so heavy malts, and honey malts, and there's a lot of different names for the melanoid type. And these can also go through the roaster and then be sacrificed and create a whole different range of flavors and colors and unique malts. So flavor, I've said a lot about Mayo reaction. Um, what is the combination of amino acids and reducing sugars? And so there's about 20 some, 20 some more than that, amino acids and a bunch of reducing sugars and malts. And you end up with hundreds of different combinations of these sugars and amino acids and how they combine. And then you can further tune that into a whole heap of other compounds and flavors to um, strike degradations and Amadori rearrangement. And, the like, and that's what gets you the final melanoidin uh, flavor compounds and color compounds. Um, uh, so, how do you know your malt is good? Uh, taste it. That's the biggest thing I can say is you have to taste it. As you're grinding, grab a handful of it. As you're developing a recipe, grab a handful of it, chew on it. It'll give you a great sense of what kind of flavors you're going to get in the beer. Um, I'd say in general, in the lighter colored malts, you get a good sense of it by chewing on it. When you get into the darker, darker malts, your chocolates and roasted barleys, it's really hard to, to taste it and understand how it's going to apply. But one thing I've found is we do a um, almost a tea, and you can see there's what I'm doing in the lab there is pretty much making a, it's a laboratory work, and it's about 25 grams of malt ground into about a cup of water. And as soon as you pour that hot water in, you get an immediate sense of what kind of aromas and smells and flavors is going to come out of this, come out of this malt and what it's going to add. And kind of playing with different colors. So you take a white chocolate and a dark chocolate and roasted barley and do them all side by side. And you get a really good sense of what each one is going to add and helps you kind of balance out, balance out the malts you're adding to the recipe to get to what you want in the final beer. Um, last one. Uh, using fresh malt is always key to getting good flavors out of it. The uh, specialty malts, um, six months is probably your, your top end of it. And as soon as they come out of the roaster, they're going to start gathering moisture from the air, oxidizing, and start losing a bit of their flavor. Um, especially as soon as you crush it. So you want to use it quickly after you crush it. Um, but again, it comes to taste. Um, you can know using fresh malt by tasting it. It should have a really good crunch to it. The crystal malt should be um, almost candy-like and crystallized. And uh, this shouldn't be turned as slack. And you get the husk taste just moist and it doesn't have the crunch to it. It doesn't break as easily in your mouth. And that's where you know you're kind of getting some older stuff or it's been, hasn't been stored properly. It's been stored, hasn't been stored sealed. It's been able to has been somewhere where it can pick up moisture, things like that. Um, when you're doing recipes, at least um, in my experience, moving from the US and coming out to New Zealand and homebrewing, is looking at the recipes I used to brew and knowing I can't get these malts anywhere. Um, what's helped a lot is knowing the, the base type of malt you're looking for. So if you're looking at a honey malt, I know that's a melanoid type malt. So I look for, say, what we make is the Aurora. And then you kind of can judge it by based on the color content, what what percentages you want to add to the beer. Um, so it's more about comparing what the base type of malt or how that malt was made to what you're trying to produce, than trying to say, I need a chocolate malt. I'm just going to go out to the home shop, pick up a chocolate malt, look at look at the color of the malt, look at um, the color of the malt, and the chocolate malt, and how it tastes, and make a decision. Um, analysis sheets are always good if you really want to get into uh, knowing a bit more. Um, I'd say they're, for base malts, it's more specific to, to maltster. So look at a couple of them. Just get a sense of what that maltster is doing in terms of the cobalt index and their fans and their colors. 
and use that as a guide for choosing that malt. Are they typically under modifying and below cobalt? Are they typically over modifying and something that's a bit high? And um, kind of choose your malts based on based on that. And for the most part, they should be consistent if they're doing their job. And if we're doing our job, the malts are going out pretty much the same every time for our, our blending. But it's a good guide for choosing your malts or choosing your malts. Um, keep an eye on your crush. Uh, you want um, it comes to tasting, it comes to looking at the grain, and it comes to getting a sense of how is there a lot of small little grains in there that are just going to fall through the rollers? Is it all pretty uniform in size? And it can make a big difference in extract to make sure that you get the right crush for the grain you're using. And again, it comes down to the monster. It's, each one is going to have their own cleaning process and screening process, and it's going to be pretty consistent across their entire range. And uh, Peter talked a lot more about this than I will, but keep an eye on your pH. It's quite important. And uh, that's it. Questions? Thank you very much.